Hello, everybody. Hey, um, this is going to be a, a, a lecture on uh, Newton's laws and the things that are associated with it, primarily um, vocabulary and things that we're going to build upon. Um, I am going to, in your first problem set, um, week five, problem set one, you are going to get a bunch of questions and not problems. So in the back of the chapter, okay, you probably haven't noticed, but there are a section on questions and there is a section on problems. You're gonna get questions which you haven't had yet. And then problem set number two is gonna have problems. So um, you guys can uh, kind of find that, but the questions tend to be more qualitative and there are less, uh, there are less numbers associated, less calculations. Okay, there are still some uh, numbers to go through. But anyways, I'm going to preface that, and we are going to talk about uh, Newton's um, uh, Newton's laws. And this is a lecture taking place on Monday the 9th, so my attention is going to go to the people in the class. Um, but hopefully I'll uh, stay within my window, uh, and we will get everything. All right, so you guys, I would say that you know that you know what Newton's three laws of motion are. Okay, can you tell me what Newton's three laws of motion are? Okay, you guys remember Newton's, Newton's laws? Correct. Okay, what is Newton's first law? Uh, an object remains at a constant velocity unless an unbalanced force acts upon it. Oh, that is brilliant. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase that. Newton's first law is an object will continue its state of motion unless acted on an by an unbalanced force. An out an outside force. You might hear that too. Um, the first the first thing um, I want to um, talk about is try to get to the kindergarten. What is the kindergarten definition of Newton's first law? Okay. What does that mean? An object in motion stays in motion. Think kindergarten, though. How are you going to explain Newton's um, first law um, to a kindergarten? This is, tr th this is perhaps a little bit tricky. Okay. Um, Newton's if an object moving, it won't stop unless something stops it. Okay, I like it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. If an object is moving, Okay, if you want to stop, if you want to stop an object and it's moving, you got to, someone's got to stop it, or something has to stop it, right? Okay, so we're gonna go. Um, an object's state of motion will remain. the same unless acted on by by an outside force. So we might say unbalanced force. An unbalanced force may be better. Okay? All right. I am going to... I'm going to skip over the second law for a moment, and we're going to talk about the third law. Okay? So, what is... What is Newton's third law? Yes, sir? For every action, there's equal opposite reaction. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay, perfect. What's the kindergarten definition? 
action and reaction. What does action and reaction mean to a kindergartner? Every way you do something, there's a way to do the opposite of it. Um, <laughs> I, I like I like the sentiment. I think that doesn't quite. Um, when he goes left, I go right. Um, but you can go left and right without talking about um, things that are, for example, touching. Okay, so here's here's my kindergarten definition. Okay. You cannot touch without being touched. Okay. You cannot touch without being touched. Okay. Um, so let's go to the a little more um, sophisticated, the sophisticated definition, and that is um, um, for every action, there is an equal. And an equal and opposite reaction. Okay. Um, now there's something that um, there's something that's called an action reaction pair. An action reaction pair. Okay. And um, I just I just want to talk about. It. I'll bring it up again. Uh, um, over um, some other examples here, um, but um, uh, if I am just standing here, are there any forces acting on me? Okay, gravity is an excellent example. Gravity is pulling me down to the ground, and we'll talk more about gravity. Uh, and wait here in a minute. Yeah. Atmospheric pressure. There is atmospheric pressure. There are molecules that are bouncing off me in all directions, in all directions, which is going to be another force. What other force is there? Um, okay. And uh, we will also we'll also talk about this here in a minute. Now, if if gravity is pulling me down, how come I'm not moving up? I mean, how, how come I'm not sinking into the ground? The floor. the floor is pushing back against me. Okay, so at least from the contact of my feet and the floor, there is an uh, an upward force by the floor and a downward force by uh, gravity. Questions? Oh, there's going to be friction forces that, um, and we'll get more to frictional forces in my next uh, in my next um, lecture, which is going to be on free body diagrams. Sorry, this thing keeps moving on me. Um, and friction, as you guys are all aware of, but perhaps have a hard time defining it, is going to be uh, force of friction is equal to mu force normal, and mu is the coefficient of friction. And um, it has to do with um, an opposing force um, that prevents motion or potential motion. An opposing force that's going to um, prevent or slow down something or keep it from moving in the first place. I'm going to have to switch masks because this is just not working. Let's see about this. This is too tight. Um, all right, let's try this. All right, so, um, so we'll get, you guys, we'll get more into this action reaction pair. All right. One, I think one of the things that is hardest to remember, but is probably most important from a analytical or 
quantitative point of view is Newton's second law. Does it, you guys can remember what Newton's second law is? What's Newton's second law? Force equals mass times acceleration. F is equal to ma. F is equal to ma. I'm gonna I'm gonna elaborate. I'm gonna elaborate on this board here. But kindergarten definition: What is a force? What is a force? And we'll just say a force is a push or pull. Okay, push or pull. So, um, if you push, if you push on a heavier object versus a lighter object, okay, the heavier one is going to accelerate less, and the lighter one is going to accelerate more. All other things, all other things being equal. Okay, so let's talk more about uh, Newton's second law, and we're going to say force is equal to m a, and I'm going to use a capital sigma there, which you all know is the sum. It's the Greek letter capital means you add up all of the forces. You guys are probably familiar with that from statistics or geometric or arithmetic um, series um, from math. Okay, but we're going to add all this up. The other thing that we are going to say is that force is a vector. So we're going to put a line over that. And acceleration is a vector. Now, probably more for convenience, more, probably more for convenience, um, even though we know that they are both vectors, in subsequent problems, we will probably, uh, we will probably um, um, leave, we probably leave those, um, uh, those things off there, okay? Now, what we can also say is, the sum of the forces um, in the uh, x direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to may. Sum of the forces in the z direction is equal to mazz. Now, given that those are vectors, we should probably be saying ijk, ijk. Um, but I just found that um, for people, for students, um, to just be a little bit confusing and they're a little more familiar with that. If you see I, J, and K, people um, can easily transfer um, uh, that. Okay. Now, you guys, um, I want to talk about um, mass. Okay. What is mass? What is mass? The amount of matter in an object. What's that? The amount of matter in an object. The amount, how much stuff, okay, would be kindergarten. So how much matter? Okay. How much stuff in an object? Okay, and then we can therefore say to get a little more sophisticated, uh, we're, we should probably put the equals density times velocity or um, mass uh, would be equal to um, uh, density times volume. Okay. This one right here being density. And volume. Um, which helps us to which helps us to distinguish, okay, um, volume from matter. Okay, so here is a, a, a typical um, science related riddle that you will often hear on elementary school playgrounds, okay? Which has more mass, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? They're both the same amount. 
they're both the same amount because we said lead. But if we actually had a pound of lead, it would be very small. And if we had a pound of feathers, it would be very large. So we do certainly want to distinguish between the volume of something uh, and it's how much mass it has and how much mass it has. So there's definitely, there's definitely a difference there. Um, but what else is what else is mass? Because if you look this up from a more technical point of view, um, it is not going to say how much matter there is. Because what would matter if you were to look up what matter is? What is matter? It would, it, and oftentimes, and I've seen this, where as you're going to say um, the amount of mass the amount of mass that something has. And that right there between those two definitions, there is a circular reason, and there's a circular reason. So we're gonna talk about um, what mass is and really bring it back to Newton's first law, which you might remember as the law of inertia, as the law of inertia. Okay, so we know that F is equal to MA, and we'll call this mass one and um, acceleration one. We're also going to say um, that we could have the same force. We could have the same force on um, another object. Okay. Now, if M2 and A2 are equal to force, and that force is equal to M1, A1, then obviously they are equal to each other. So we're going to have uh, M2A2 is equal to M1A1. Now we're going to essentially divide. We're going to divide both sides by M2 and divide both sides by um, uh, acceleration 1. And now we can get a relationship. Okay. We can get a, a relationship between acceleration acceleration in mass okay so we can say that for a given force the more mass that you have the less acceleration that you're going to get for the same force the more mass you have the less acceleration you're going to get so mass and acceleration are inversely proportional as one goes up the other one goes down but um, we can kind of bring this back to Newton's first law, uh, and it says, let me, let me see how I wanted to phrase this. Um, uh, mass is a measure of its resistance to its change in state of motion. Okay, so mass, ugh, mass is a measure of its change in is a measure of its resistance resistance to uh, its change of motion okay and if we kind of come back here and look at this one, um, an object um, is an object something that's moving, something that has to stop it. Okay, an object's state of motion will remain um, the same unless acted on by an outside force. Okay, so its state of motion will stay the same. And if it doesn't, then we're going to have a resistance to that change. Okay. So mass is really just a measure of its resistance to its change of state. So if you were going to push um, on two cars, let's get sort of ridiculous there, and we're going to have a Austin Mini versus a big semi-truck, okay, a tractor trailer. Okay, and you pushed on two of those, that were, had, did not have their brakes on and they were on level ground and you pushed, which one would accelerate more? 
the, the lighter one is going to accelerate more because it has less mass. It has less resistance. It has less resistance to its change in motion. Okay. We do the burst. Now we've got this big semi truck and this Austin Mini. Okay. And they are moving at one mile per hour, one mile per hour on level ground. Okay. And you wanted to stop it. Which one's going to be easier to stop? Again, it's going to be the Austin Mini because it has less mass and therefore less inertia. Okay. So inertia is a measure of its resistance resistance to its change in motion. So inertia, inertia is essentially the equivalent of uh, mass. Um, let me, what is inertia? Here's what I found. Inertia is a resistance to any physical object to any change in its velocity, including the change of an object's speed or direction of motion. Okay. What is mass? Here's some information. Mass is both a property of a physical body and a measure of its resistance to acceleration when a net force is applied. So we can see there that they are certainly related. But let's talk more um, about the practical, the practical things about mass. Okay, so, okay, mass is again, we don't have to define this, but it is going to be a measure, it's gonna be a measure of um, its inertia, okay, its resistance, okay. Um, uh, mass units, okay. So what are, what are the units, Hello. what are the units for mass? Kilograms. Okay, oh, wait, yeah, so, um, so for the S and the SI, it's going to be kilograms. Okay, which is about 2.2 pounds. It's about 2.2 pounds. Okay. Um, what are the what are force units? Newtons. Newtons. Okay. Now force is equal to m a. So this is going to be a kilogram meter per second squared. Okay. So the base units, the base units for a force is a kilogram meter per second squared. And if we went around talking about kilogram meters per second squared all the time when we we're talking about forces, it would be really a bit awkward. So um, it is going to be measured in uh, newtons. And that is abbreviated, abbreviated with a capital N. It is abbreviated with a capital N. Uh, N. Okay, so what is weight? What is weight? Um, okay, pounds is an example. Pounds is an example of weight, okay? But a little more definitive, what is weight? Yes, sir. An object. Go ahead. An object's force due to gravity? It's an object's force due to gravity. It's force of gravity acting on an object, right? So we just said force. So weight is the force due to its mass times its acceleration, times its acceleration due to gravity. What's the acceleration due to gravity? 9.8. Okay, on Earth it's 9.8, but if we were somewhere else, then we would just call it G. Okay, so weight is equal to mg. Weight is equal to mg. Okay, so if I had, if I had a mass, if my mass was 100 kilograms, okay, then what would my weight, what would my weight be? What's that? 
on Earth? What is my weight? Excellent point there. What is my weight on the surface of the Earth? Nine hundred and eighty is going to be correct. So it would be equal to nine hundred and eighty newtons. Now, if I had if I had a mass of a hundred kilograms and someone asked me how much I weigh in the United States, I would say that I weigh two hundred and twenty pounds. I would say I weigh two hundred and twenty pounds, which would be correct. Now. I may be a bit pudgy, but I'm not 100 kilograms. I'm not 220 pounds. I just want to get that out there. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to say um, my weight is equal to 980 newtons, which is 220 pounds, uh, and that would equal to 100 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. And do you, do you recall, do you know, what is the acceleration due to gravity in imperial units, in feet? Yes, sir. It's actually 32, but that's a, that's a good call, right? So it's 32 feet per second squared, okay? Which leaves us, which leaves us, what is the mass unit? What is the mass unit uh, in imperial units? What is the, what's say that again? Mass. It's not mass, that's, that's a reasonable guess. It's not pounds. And it's not pounds because pounds is the actual force. Pounds is a force unit. Pounds is a force unit. It is not a mass unit. Special? No. Ounces? Say again? Ounces. If you guys don't know this, you guys are slugs. Okay? Fine. Uh, it is slugs. Okay. The, the, a slug, uh, it, a slug is uh, the unit, the mass unit in imperial um in the imperial system. Okay, now this 100 kilograms, which is equivalent to about 6.9 slugs. About 6.9 slugs. So if I took 6.9 times 32, 6.9 times 32, 6.9 times 32, is equal to 220.8. Okay, so we can see here that um, that is kind of the equivalent. So how can I say, if someone asked me, what is my weight? And I would say 220 pounds, if, in, if of course, my weight is that. Um, I am going to say um, that my weight is... Um, Ninety five kilograms. Okay, more or less. Okay, so my mass is ninety five. What's my weight? Someone asked me for my weight, I would say two hundred and nine pounds. Okay, and then they said, No, what is it in metric? And then I said, um, And I said 931 newtons. No one would have any idea what I was talking about outside of physics students. But if I then said, I'm about 95 kilograms, people would know what I was talking about because one kilogram is the equivalent of 2.2 pounds on the surface of the earth. And we can't really say, we can't really say that they're equal, okay? But for practical purposes, they're equal, they're only technically different. So how can we say that if we're talking about the difference between mass and force or weight? And the reason for that is anywhere we go on the surface of the earth, we are on the surface of the earth. 
and the acceleration is always going to be 9.8 meters per second squared or 32 feet per second squared. So because the A or the G there is always the same, then the force and the, um, and the mass are proportional. So we can certainly do that, okay? But when it comes to our class and I'm asking for weight, I want Newtons because it is a force, okay? Now, you might get you might get the uh, occasional you might get the occasional question that's going to be dealing um, with pounds and slugs and feet per second. So you could certainly look those things up. Okay, you should no doubt know that the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth is nine point eight, which is really close to ten, which makes it a great number for doing a quick little estimation. If I asked you for something um, like slugs. OK, you probably won't remember that it is uh, 0.069. OK, but you could look it up or just calculate it. And it's not it's not that uh, it's not that big a deal. OK, so we've got the mass units. We've got force units. We've got weight. OK, and these are all things that you should be familiar with. All those things you should be familiar with from a definitional, uh, from a definitional point of view. Okay. Now, we talked about uh, Newton's. We talked about Newton's laws. Um, and um, what I would like, what I would like to talk about is just a scenario um, for us to think about and how it applies here. And uh, in in a car, okay, we're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have a your seat, your car seat, and a uh, steering wheel, and then we might have. Okay, so we might have something like this. Okay, so my first question for you is, what is the purpose? What is the purpose for a headrest? And the real purpose is not to rest your head, although you could. What is the purpose? To prevent your neck from jerking back during um, negative acceleration. Excellent. If you got in an accident, okay, and someone hit you from behind, okay, so you had this large force that hit you from behind, okay, um, why would your neck, why would your neck snap back? Now you know it happens, right? When you get hit from behind, okay, you're gonna your your head's gonna go back, right? Okay. Now we know that, but let's do it. Think about it in terms of Newton's first law. In Newton's first law, an object in motion will stay in motion less acted by an outside force. So the neck will stay in its relative position. The car itself will be moved forward. Okay. So. The answer is, and that's an excellent point, that's exactly right, but our neck, our head, and it's probably more specifically our head, is not, is not snapped back. As you pointed out, our car is snapped forward. The car is snapped forward in the same way that if we took a, um, a plate on a piece of paper on on uh, the table, and we just jerked the um, um, jerked the paper. The plate stays the same, okay? And it's the paper that's getting jerked. That's kind of the same thing we're having here, except our head is the plate, and our car is being the paper. But unfortunately, okay, our head is attached to our body. Only unfortunate in the fact that it's uh, in this scenario. 
So what happens is the whole car gets snapped forward, okay, and our head stays there. It's connected by our neck, and that's when our neck gets tweaked. It gets stretched out. It gets all the ligaments and our vertebrae are just get totally uh, tweaked because they're going to get stretched and they're going to get bent in a way that is not good, okay? And that can cause um, a lot of damage. So what happens is you've now got this headrest here, okay, that is going to prevent your head from snapping back, and I'm saying that in quotes, because this brings up the point of what's called a frame of reference, okay, a frame of reference. Okay, it is um, how we It's how we measure things, okay? It's how we measure things. And to do a recent example, okay, um, if, I, if we were talking about the direction, the direction that we go, north, south, east, and west, that would be one particular way in which we would have a frame of reference, okay? If I'm going that direction, I'm going north, okay? So that is, that is my frame of reference. From a, um, we could kind of have the same, we could have the same frame of reference, but we could talk about um, going X and Y. We could talk about an angle. Now our angle, and again, it's still the same reference frame, it's how, it's how we kind of describe this. So now, um, for frame of reference, okay? Okay, an inertial frame of reference, okay, is our measuring frame that does not that is, does not accelerate, okay? A frame of reference is something that we can view it, we can view it as um, something that is not accelerating, okay? So, when we're in our car, usually our frame of reference in our car, okay, is that um, everything in our car is not moving, okay? And we could even say, um, a frame of reference here is everything in our car is not moving. So if I threw a pen up when I was going, when I was going um, in the car, okay, if I threw it straight up, let's say 30 centimeters and it came back 30 centimeters, it's going straight up and straight down. It does not have any lateral movement. But if you were sitting on the outside of the car, okay, on the side of the road, for example, and you threw, and I threw uh, the uh, pen up and it went up and down. For some outside observer, not in your frame of reference, okay, they would see it move in a parabolic curve. They would see it move in a parabolic curve. In the same way that if they were sitting on the side and they were to kind of throw it up and move it here, that arc would be kind of would be um, synonymous with how the object would move in the car. But if your frame of reference is the car, okay, then it's just going straight up and straight down, okay? So an inertial, inertial frame of reference, your frame of reference cannot be accelerating for it to be a true um, inertial frame of reference, okay? So in that case, when you're driving in a car, you're normally thinking that's your frame of reference, okay? And if suddenly you get hit from behind, okay, you you feel like your head gets snapped back, okay, and it does, okay. From the frame of reference of your car, your head is getting snapped back. Um, but from an outside observer, okay, now we think about it, if we get hit from behind, 
our whole frame of reference, our whole frame of reference is getting accelerated because we're hit, okay? So it's not an inertial frame of reference. So we need to kind of step, step back from that uh, inertial frame of reference. Okay, so now we've hit frame of reference, right? We've figured out what this headrest is really for, okay? Um, what happens, what happens if you ran into, let's say you ran into, okay, you ran into a tree in your car. Now what's going to happen? Your seatbelt's going to stop you from flying. Your seatbelt, so what is your seatbelt for is to, what is your seatbelt for? What's that? Airbags. And we're going to, we'll get to airbags. And if you go way back to when I was a kid, okay, when there was no such thing as airbags, all you had there was um, a seatbelt, okay? And actually, the seatbelt you had just went around your waist, just went around your waist. So what is that seatbelt for? Continuing the right. So again, from a um, from a Newton's first law, if your car suddenly stops, Newton's first law says you keep going. Right. So this is to slow you down. Okay. Now, um, if you just if you just have this lap belt, okay. Now you stop and you go this way, and your head hits against your head hits against the steering wheel. Ouch. Okay. Now, so now if we add on, if we add on the shoulder thing, now I am going to, I'm going to slow down with both the lap belt and the shoulder strap. Okay. But isn't the steering wheel going to stop us? Yeah. The steering wheel is going to stop us. So why do we need, why do we need the seatbelt and the shoulder strap if we're going to stop anyways? So you want to slow down our acceleration to the force of our impact on the steering wheel, isn't that great? Or it's less damaging. Perfect. Okay, so now we're kind of we're kind of skipping ahead. We're kind of skipping ahead to Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So second law, if we hit the steering wheel or the windshield, or if you're in the passenger side, you're going to hit the the dashboard. Okay, you are going to um, you are going to um, stop very, very quickly, right? If your head hits the steering wheel, okay, you're going to stop very quickly, which means acceleration, change in velocity over time. Short time, great acceleration, great acceleration, great force. So as you pointed out, what we're trying to do is slow our change in velocity. We're trying to decrease, we're trying to decrease the time at which we stop, thereby lowering the average force, okay? Now, here, if we just had the lap belt, we get this, we get this snapping back and we're gonna get some rotational sort of stuff there, okay? So now the problem is, is that this right here um, can still cause, the seat belt itself can cause uh, a lot of damage, okay? And as you pointed out, okay, we also get, uh, in newer technology, we're going to get um, airbags, okay? So what does an airbag do? Okay, we get, we get hit from the front, and an incredible, an incredible, incredibly fast chemical reaction takes place, uh, and it is going to inflate this airbag, okay? And... Um, then when your head goes into this, it's going to make it slow down over this amount of distance and therefore increase the time, okay, um, and therefore reduce that force even further, okay. Uh, and um, as um, this obviously is from the center of your steering wheel, there is usually one that is um, um, on the passenger side. Um, what happens? What happens if you get hit from the side? Okay. Well, then there's all those other issues. You could get hit by the side of your window. Okay. Or your head can go, 
your head would go slamming into the side of your window. And as technology and as this airbag idea has increased, uh, now you're going to have side impact airbags. And you're going to get airbags, some airbags that deploy uh, deploy from the, from the bottom there to keep your legs from whipping forward. So it's really an incredible, it's really an incredible amount of uh, technology due to overcome uh, Newton's laws of motion of stopping really fast. Okay, so uh, it's really uh, pretty incredible. So this gives you kind of an idea. This kind of gives you kind of an idea of um, um, the um, technologies that uh, employed to kind of keep us safe. So notice how what we've talked about here, there's more explanation. So, and that's really where the difference between the questions at the end of the end of the chapter, the questions at the end of the chapter and the problems at the end of the chapter um, are going to be, um, are going to be different. Um, and so in our week five, Problem set one, it's really going to be a question set, and you're going to be explaining things and thinking about things um, more than you are of actually doing calculations, okay? So I think I have covered all that I want for, um, for the conceptual or the qualitative parts, the qualitative parts of uh, Newton's laws, first, second, and third. He also has the law of gravity, which we will talk about in due course.